Good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to another fantastic session of Nappy Virtual. And we're in partnership with the Dubai International Content Market. My name is Lori H. Schwartz, and I am principal at Storytech and also a governor at the Television Academy here in the US, where we're always looking at the latest content trends. And so today, in this session, we're going to dig into some exciting content trends specifically in the Middle East and North African region, which is called MENA. 14 countries compromise that exciting region. And we're gonna get into all the disruption and exciting expansion that's happening in this crazy time. And I wanna introduce our fantastic speakers. Uh, we have Faminda de Souza, who is manager of IFE and media services for SPOFX, which is a global content agency, part of the fantastic largest Marcom agency, WPPP. And Susan Salton, who's the content acquisition and strategy manager for eVision, which is a digital content provider and sister agency to Ita Salat. So welcome, Faminda, and welcome, Susan. Good morning, good evening to you guys, right? So I, I want to start off um, really by digging into some content trends and discussion around a really exciting content vertical, which obviously is having an interesting moment um, in the current marketplace, and that's in-flight entertainment, which is an industry that's been around for 40 years. I don't think a lot of us realize it. So um, it's a mature industry. So let, let's start with you, Faminda. Maybe give us a little uh, you know, education on the past and present of this fantastic industry. And Susan, jump in whenever you'd like, okay? All right. So the in-flight entertainment industry is a very niche industry. A lot of our distributors and studios probably were not aware that we existed, and but everybody has flown an airplane, and you know that there is some sort of entertainment option on board. The truth is that content agencies such as ourselves have been partners with these major global brands to bring passengers and guests the best entertainment that there is to offer. And it is a multi-billion dollar industry. And we're currently watching the scenario as it unfolds to see where this will take us. And right now, obviously, with travel sort of curtailed, um, but it is such a vibrant industry. What should people be thinking about um, who have spent in that marketplace? Um, because it's not a time to not do anything, right? People should be digging in and, and leveraging this great channel. So do you have any advice uh, for folks who want to dig into the in-flight industry? I would say at the moment, because the entire entertainment industry has slowed down with their productions, look into your catalogs, your historical and recent catalogs and come forward. It is true that we would love the airline industry to be at its, well, its peak before March. And it's not like that, but that does not mean that companies like ourselves, as well as the airlines themselves, aren't advocating to bring the industry back to what it was before. So we are around, the airlines are around, and I'd say patience for now, just like every other industry in the world. We'll do the best with what we have, and we plan to grow incrementally. Right, and you should be making your plans now, right, Susan? You can't just not do anything. You have to be thinking about what next year is going to be looking like. Yes, uh, that is definitely there. Uh, to be honest, what we are going through right now, uh, somehow uh, it was an, another door opener for us as a content provider and producer. Um, we, it, it was a way for us to develop more despite all the, uh, the difficulties we are having around us especially in Middle East, because we always had limitations when it comes to the content and when it comes to the digital content and streaming. Uh, this period actually encouraged each and every person in this industry to look at it in a bigger way. Uh, there is a lots of plan for uh, 2021, and uh, and there is, I can, I can bet as a content uh, person, it's going to be even bigger and bigger. Um, um, we're getting in some questions. I just wanted to do a little um, 
bookkeeping here and just say that if you have a question throughout uh, today's session, please type it into the chat and we'll be circling back on all of that on some Q&A. Um, and before I dig into any questions, I was wondering if you ladies could also help us understand the MENA region, which is again, the Middle East and North Africa, which com comprises 14 countries again. What, what, tell us some trends about MENA. You know, what, what is at the heart of this fantastic and diverse region? In MENA, actually, we had only one source of content that was the free to air channel. And things have been progressing and changing in the last uh, seven to eight years. So uh, we are growing in MENA when it comes to the content and a way to actually enjoy uh, the content and entertainment industry. Uh, at the moment, due to the digital uh, introduction uh, in MENA, we are uh, looking for uh, diversity, definitely. Uh, we have lots of opportunity actually to explore uh, I can say we, yes, I can. I, I, I'm, I'm proud to say we are brave enough at this period actually to experiment in our scripts, uh, to actually uh, discover new talents and new casts and new directors. Uh, so we we do have our boundaries, we do have our conservative mindset but uh, compared to only the few years we are much much open actually for diversity and opportunity when it comes to the content and Faminda, how about you what what are your thoughts on this exciting region from the in-flight entertainment perspective the mina carriers have been one of the drivers in terms of innovation and content trends for the in-flight entertainment industry and it is such such a diverse region because not only do you have a very, very strong local presence, but you have so many expats living here as well. So we always have to keep an eye on global trends as well as the MENA trends. And that it, it it's interesting it, and it keeps evolving. Are, are there, um, you know, I don't know if you have a number for this, but I imagine that language and translation is a big part of this. Is there, you know, a trend around translation right now, or you know, what language things come out in when you have such a diverse region? Um, you know, how do you handle that? That I will uh, allow me to add to that. Actually, uh, the entire Mina, we all speak the Arabic language, the Arabic classic. Uh, it has been since. Uh, 1920, whatever content which is not Arabic, we will have the Arabic subtitle to it. And it is one one Arabic, one classic Arabic. We do speak different accents. We do speak different, uh, we have our own dialects, but at the end we all meet to the one Arabic classic uh, uh, accent. To, I mean. So we have a, a question that came in about, um, you know, just acquisition of um, foreign content. So um, someone, uh, Patrick was asking, in 14 Middle Eastern country, countries, how many broadcasters, pay TV and streaming services, telco and other production companies have the ability to buy foreign finished content, scripted or unscripted? Like, um, is that a traditional thing to buy content from the outside, bring it in and, and have it on your platform, especially in, in the, you know, airline vertical? Any, any thoughts on acquisition there? Yeah. And here in particular here in Dubai in UAE, yes, it is a trend. It's been always because Dubai has been always a multinational uh, spot. Uh, we always actually had, uh, it's part of our KPIs to acquire and understand the trend of non-Arabic content uh, to maintain actually the expat number in the region. And, uh, and to, uh, but to be very particular, Dubai, it is a very small portion of the entire uh, MENA. Still, as of today, the Arabic content, uh, it's higher important than the Western content. Than Western content. And, and is that the same case going down the funnel with the airline industry? With the in-flight entertainment industry, yeah. we have to keep a broad mix of not only local content. So for example, if I was to say there is this Middle Eastern carrier um, that we look after, they have content from almost every part of the world. 
because when you look at the demographics flying on board, they are usually representative of almost all the nationalities of the world. So we do work with a lot of foreign language content and a lot of Hollywood content as well. The big studios have well-established sales teams with the implied entertainment industry. So we, we look at everything. Right, so locally more regional, and then as we get into in-flight, we obviously globalize. And just some more questions on this. We have an exciting um, chatty audience. This is from Beatrice. She's wondering, you know, in terms of kids' content, um, are there great opportunities in MENA? Um, are digital platforms more suitable for, for foreign kids? Or, you know, um, is it better for free or pay TV? Are there any trends that you're seeing in, in um, children's content, um, both from a top level and then into in-flight entertainment? Kids' content is always at the top of the list. Always. It has been always at the top of the list. And obviously, in MENA, we always require the, uh, the, con the, Arabic, the kids' content to be in Arabic. But out here, we dub everything in Arabic. We have all kind of international kids content in the region. And everything is almost dubbed in Arabic or subtitled to Arabic. I mean, it depends. After, if any content actually targeting above seven, we can have it subtitled in Arabic. Below that, always it's uh, dubbed in Arabic. And majority of the kids content actually, it's, uh, it's without dialogue. So it's, it has been always suitable. But it's always on demand, kids. Content. And is it are there are, is there a lot more consumption happening on digital streaming platforms? You know, are kids watching it? You know, like in the U.S., there's a lot of actually you know tablet consumption um, outside of that broadcast TV scenario. Is that the case in trends in Mina as well? Is the same trend in me the trend in Mina and all the digital uh, platform uh, kids content actually. Uh, one of the most important category we focus on. Oh, interesting. And then, then from an in-flight entertainment perspective, I know having a 10-year-old who I've schlepped all over the world, <laughs> that that in-flight entertainment is key. So are there any trends around uh, kids um, for, for you? I'd say there are seasons for kids' content only because we don't have so many kids flying. So during the summer holidays or the Christmas holidays or any other holidays, there would be an uptick in acquisitions for kids' content, but otherwise only because it's primarily adults who fly around for business or leisure, um, it would be non-kids' content, but family-friendly. Family-friendly, right, but not specific to kids. Um, and let's talk a little bit about acquisition, um, acquisition trends um, in the current time you know it's it's 2020 we're in the middle of this pandemic again you, you know are our acquisitions going to be picking up soon as we head closer to 21 you know have things slowed down a lot right now as we're all in this pause mode is are there any trends around acquisition right now that you could share with us and you mean looking at the the situation the, the current situation yeah okay the current situation did actually play a big role to modify our strategy, but that nevertheless never uh, reduced the importance of acquire aggressively. Uh, it actually, the importance of the acquisition went even higher uh, at this period uh, of time. Uh, yes, and um, and actually, um, as a content person, I'm really happy to see it going higher despite all the challenges. And the challenges is not always it's about the, the the cost or the budget. It has been um, challenging from every angle, actually. But no, we are still, uh, I mean, as a digital platform, we still have to acquire aggressively and we have to always uh, think about our programming strategy even more than the acquisition. And uh, and that is going to help us to carry on for, uh, for 2020 and future. Do, do either of you see any trends around genres? Um, you know, Faminda, is there a more popular genres in, in an in-flight entertainment scenario? You know, are there any genres that always do well in MENA? Um, you know, um, uh, here, uh, I think there are, are trends right now in, we went through a like live musical thing in the US where all the networks were doing a lot of live musicals. Um, 
you know, are there are there any genre trends in your world? Funnily enough, comedy continues to do very well before, during, and probably even after this whole pandemic. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just such a crowd pleaser, and because passengers just look to be entertained and you know have some stress-free ideas going around in their heads, or it's probably why it has been so popular in the mm. IFV industry. So, so comedy because we do we do need to laugh right now. Yes. <laughs> sure. and, and what about you, Susan? Any any genres really popping in the Mina marketplace? Again, comedy plays the top of the list. Comedy is a very uh, important and it is like an evergreen. Comedy always works for us. Comedy always works. Um, it, we have a question coming in um, about the Latino content, um, which certainly in North America is, is, is a huge growing marketplace. Um, so there's some questions about, is Latino content growing in MENA at all? Is that a, a popular growth area? Okay. For, our, for our MENA airlines, not so much, but because we do look after airlines, including American Airlines, Delta, um, Air Canada, there probably could be scope over there. And uh, you could reach out to us and we'd reroute you back to the correct person if you need someone. Right, so so it's still a, it's still a popular content for, you know, model for in-flight entertainment, just not necessarily in that in your, your region right now. And and, um, and what about you, Susan? Are are you looking more at uh, Latino content? Okay, Latino content is in our DNA. Actually, we grew with the Latino content, uh, and it was always dubbed in Arabic, the telenovelas we call it. And uh, and I don't think the telenovela uh, importance will go down ever. Uh, we, we the, for some reason in Middle East we really we are really fond of Latino content, but we will be more selective what kind of uh, Latino content we choose. I mean to match our uh, culture and our censorship, but it has been always in demand till today. Hmm. Well, if you were um, going to be meeting with a uh, an international distributor to sort of help them understand the opportunities in the marketplace. What would you what would you tell them? What advice would you give to an international distributor? Okay, uh, when it comes to the Latino or, or in general? Uh, MENA in, in general. Okay, um, we, we are open to all kinds of content uh, and we do have some conservation when it comes to our culture or religion. Okay, so uh, nevertheless, we will try to uh, select the, that kind of content which actually would not contradict with, with our culture. But thanks to uh, the digital world, we, I think we are a, a, a now more lean than uh, previously, but we will always work on the censorship actually, and we will uh, edit whatever is not suitable for us. Right, so so culturally making the content relevant is not necessarily a challenge. You could take any content from any culture, and then you'll do the work to help shape it to the appropriate means. And, and 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 from the in-flight perspective, is that the case as well? Are you reshaping content to be culturally relevant? We call them uh, editorial requirements in IFE, <laughs> uh, but it's very much um, the same for us. It's uh, every airline is specific in their own requirements. The first thing any distributor has to remember is that these airlines are hospitality brands. And uh, therefore, I come with a checklist of the basic editorial requirements every time I meet a distributor. And anything that fits within that, we are willing to talk to a distributor about. So we definitely keep our doors open to speak to everyone as well. Um, I'm just checking out some of the questions here, but I just had one guys, um, one question for you guys. Are there any trends in the region right now that have really surprised you? You know that you you were really surprised by, you weren't expecting, um, in terms of either acquisition behaviors or consumption behaviors, you know, anything, you know, because you guys are experienced at this world and you've seen a lot, um, any, anything really blow you away? 
that you didn't expect? I'd say on behalf of everyone within the industry, all platforms, content came in the same level almost as much as food, shelter, and water. Interesting. It, okay. that, and that, that was really interesting mm. that it's a very human requirement for people to want to consume content, whether it's, you know, just by audio or it's a video thing or it's an interactive thing. People like that. They want that. So that, that it was very interesting to see that uh, behavior come out in everyone. So it's just as important as um, food and shelter. I mean, obviously not literally as important, but, but in terms of exactly. uh, um, consumption, you know, especially because we're all, you know, staying at home. Um, and, and that's been true in the U.S. and I'm sure globally that content consumption has gone up. Um, what about you, Susan? Any any surprises? I'm not surprised, but I'm fascinated actually by us in the Middle East. We are really, I think, a, a very curious audience. Uh, we we enjoyed and we always had a high rating with different kind of content, even Korean, Japanese. I uh, even tried with an Italian content. Uh, we are always open actually, and uh, uh, we like to experiment. Even when we tried to. Uh, publish Japanese anime. They were, we had a higher, I mean, a very high uh, audience for it. So I think we are really looking for something different. And uh, we are really into into German, and it's part of uh, our life. So very, very diverse marketplace and hungry for, for, for great content. Um, some questions coming in, you know, what are the, um, who, who's purchasing? content in the Middle East? Is there a particular type of network, studio? Um, you know, is, are there any trends in who's who's doing the most acquisitions? Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer the, or I understood the question, but basically each platform will, will have its own department which is dedicated to the purchasing, uh, whatever, like the network or the paid channel or even any digital platform and i think the same comes to the end flight we can confirm that but each platform they will have their own department to do the acquisition and the programming right so there's no i think the um the, the audience was just at wondering if there's anyone that's been really aggressive in acquiring content any major company or studio that might not be the case as everyone's you know sort of all, um, hungry to feed their audiences right now. Um, someone was asking also, um, what about independent producers? Um, documentaries, short films, um, fact-based content. Um, a lot of our independent producers are always concerned, how do they get into this marketplace? Um, are you seeing any difference um, between you know how how independent producers get in and how mainstream um, studios and networks get in or is acquisitions balanced um, is there a, a path for independent uh, production companies I'd say it depends on the quality of the piece of content I have worked with a handful of independent producers and distributors only because their quality was that good um, the, if you look at the big, say, factual studios and all, the kind of production quality that goes into those filmings is very hard to keep up with. And the in-flight entertainment industry uh, end user, I'd say, is so particular about what they want to see on board. So as long as the quality matches up, the playing field is level for everyone. Mm. That, that's great to hear. I know there's a lot of um, concern for for smaller companies right now. Um, we have another question coming in from Anna. Um, is there an interest in women themes and uh, women oriented content? Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah women oriented content actually. Yes, uh, and I I don't know um, if you will agree with me, but majority of the the broadcasters out here, their main target audience is the women. So, uh, oh, that's women, cool. yeah, the, the main 
audience is always, has been always a female. And uh, we will have specific channels for male, but the, the major uh, audience always has been a woman, a female. So the answer is yes. So, so there, you have more female, more. There's more female content consumption um, in in Mina than than. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So that's a great opportunity right there. Uh, and um, um, Paminda, has there been any like um, interesting trends in in flight around genders? Unfortunately, only I'm only saying unfortunately because I'm a woman <laughs> it used to be men who used to fly primarily. So it used to be mostly male skewed content, mm. but that has changed now. I mean, if you look at the three of us, uh, we're in that position as well. <laughs> yes. uh, so it's it's become more uh, like 50-50 kind of content, but still you know, something lifestyle oriented, um, not not uh, women skewed drama so much, but definitely something that would fit the palette of a woman traveler. Interesting. Um, there's another question coming in about um, business flyers, um, but now segueing off to what about live news content, daily, the daily finance market roundups, um, the type of local news uh, that you know in North America seems to be very popular? Is is that um, a big uh, content area for both of you? Um, that local local news, financial summaries, you know, business information, the type of stuff that we normally would get maybe on our commute to to work, um, but now we're you know, stay at home, and then in flight. Was that an interesting area that people were interested in? So, can you speak to that that sort of live news and um, you know day to day information? The technology in IFE has evolved quite a bit. So, a lot of airlines are already um, enabling this kind of thing. I remember on several airlines, was it last year when they had the Rugby World Cup that was streamed live on board planes. So oh, there, wow. is, there is a scope for that. And um, it has already been done. Big, big channels like Euronews, BBC, and all do have feeds into some airlines. Yeah. And Su yeah. Susan, how about you? Are you acquiring programming in that area as well? I don't acquire that kind of content, but uh, how, uh, if, 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 the, if the question is, do we have scope here in the Middle East? Yes. We have the live streaming, whether news, whether sport is uh, one of the significant content actually in Middle East. So interesting. Um, so you have such an um, exciting audience who has so many questions for you guys. Um, so um, some more questions about that translation piece that we talked about before. You had said that everything is in, is in Arabic, but um, I guess there's some questions around um, if if content's coming in other than English, would clients be willing to pay for the cost of subtitles, or where does that budget line for translation happen? You know, and and is that something that someone coming from non-English or non-Arabic speaking countries has to think about when they bring content to you? Okay, there is no fixed term when it comes to the language. There is no fixed term. But yes, uh, there is so many different uh, models we dealt with it in the Middle East. Either the broadcaster or the platform, they will invest to translate or to do the subtitle. Or actually the, the provider or the aggregator, he is willing to do the subtitle and he will be the owner of these uh, subtitled tracks to sell it somewhere else later. Oh, okay. So if you take on the cost, then at least you can make it up later um, when you pass it on. And and what about you? Is that true in in flight as well? Unfortunately, not so much. But there is one exception. Uh, we do do a lot of something called Bollywood Arabic films. Um, that's that's only because Bollywood has been such a, a popular, popular genre yeah. over here. And uh, that kind of content is readily available. So that would be easy to pick up. But we wouldn't necessarily translate something or get something, maybe something subtitled. 
but that would be completely up to uh, an airline if they would want to do that. Well, there's a, a just a, another question about that. Is uh, is subtitling more popular, or is dubbing more popular, or does it just depend on the type of content that we're dealing with? Equally popular. The more accessible content is, the better it travels. So. I, I'd say equally popular, but it would have to be available because it's quite resource intensive to do. To do to do either and, and yeah. both. What, yeah. what about you, Susan? Um, is there one that you're leaning more in the direction of? The, the, the subtitle is the trend and the habits. It's the first thing we actually grew with it. So uh, the subtitle is number one and the dubbing actually, it's, it, it's a new trend started on the 80s then it disappeared and again at the beginning of the 2000 brought up again but subtitle is the first subtitle is the first one okay cool um some more questions we'll take one more on lifestyle uh, on content and genre content um we have um someone asking about lifestyle content is that also as popular you guys mentioned comedy we talked about children's content um, and obviously having to make things culturally suitable, but lifestyle content, is that popular in, in your region? Yes, definitely. We all like to keep up with the trends, so definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's actually, um, when, when you fly is a great chance to find out what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, exactly. I think a, a lot of people look forward to getting exposed to global trends on, in flight. And, and Susan, how about you? Is, is lifestyle content popular? This would be talk shows, fashion shows, um, how to how tos, things like that. Yeah, lifestyle content is very popular, but the the one which is produced actually uh, or customized for uh, for the audience, we do acquire lifestyle content, but it's, it was never the must to have. It, it was always the nice to have. What is must to have? It is produced lifestyle content. So very, very particular to the region. Yes. Very right. So it really has to have a, a local piece to it. Um, let, and let's take a step out, out now for a minute on um, trends and we'll circle back to them because you're, the audience here is just has so many questions for you, for you ladies. Um, but what, one question about, look, we're in the middle of this uh, you know, global, global pandemic and you know, we're at a wonderful festival right now for content. Um, what, what are the, what's, what's happening with virtual versus face-to-face -face meetings? Like how important is it and how disruptive has it been not to be able to sit down in person and have sales conversations? You know, has there been an evolution in your process for acquisition and sales here? And, and really in explaining all these great opportunities that you're sharing with us right now. I think for us, it's been a little harder because we do do the rounds of all the major markets in the world. And there's nothing like two parties coming to the table and saying, this is what we have and this is what we expect. There, it's, it's so much of an opportunity to be able to ask the questions, see the marketing collateral, uh, come up with new ideas on the spot. Um, I, wish, I wish this thing had never happened to us. And, Fortunately, we are in the situation. Um, however, the other side is that there were distributors that were not able to travel to these markets before. So things like this webinar where, um, Laurie, I do not know if I would have got the chance to uh, attend one of your webinars before, but um, it's it's been an opportunity in a way. Right, uh, you get to, to see my my office. <laughs> um, and Susan, what about you? Has it impacted how you connect with your customers and um, and contact producers? Um, for, for me in particular, it was not as uh, a bad challenge. It was, uh, it's a good, it's a new way actually to deal with it because from the start, uh, uh, I had to deal with uh, content providers who are actually not uh, uh, close to me or they are based on where I'm based. Majority of my content providers and producers, they are either in Egypt, mainly in Egypt or Lebanon or Jordan or North Africa. They, they were never actually, uh, I mean, in my area. So uh, 
I didn't I didn't feel it was the, the acquisition part. It was not to close the deal was never a challenge. After that, that was the challenge. Actually, the pre-acquisition it was not the challenge. After that, it was that challenge. Right. So this is maybe helping close close that loop. And you know, we are in such a global world right now, and this kind of stuff has brought us even closer together. Um, do you think that the outcome of uh, the pandemic will be globalization of content or better throughput through the different regions? Um, you know, do you see that being a trend? Um, you know, content acquisition will now open up a little bit more globally. Uh, because we do have this easy access to each other. Um, I mean, I'm just starting my day here and you guys are wrapping yours up, but <laughs> but there's still we're still talking to each other. So do, do you think we'll see some changes in, in acquisition trends because of this? That is a very good question. I think our appetites have grown. So that's one trend that will drive globalization because one of the reasons Say, for example, I would watch Japanese TV with um, English subtitles mm -hmm. is uh, only because I would have run out of my good Western box sets. So right. I definitely see that opportunity. That's, that's, a, that's such a great point because we're all now watching content that has already been made since live production is just getting back into swing and fairly limited right now in terms of what you're allowed to do. So that's a great point. So we're all expanding our appetite out to other types of content. H have you found that as well, Susan? Do you think there are more things that in your library that will be accessed now? Absolutely, actually. Um, we, I, I personally believe in diversity and, uh, and to be open and curious for other content. And I feel this period actually pushed for what I believe that to be more curious and to discover other type of content and uh, understand other cultures and discover other heroes uh, than the heroes we have. And in fact, today, I'm, I'm very glad to, to see uh, lots of talent being discovered due to uh, the pandemic uh, period we are going through right now. Oh, that's so interesting. So because people are digging back into content that they haven't seen before, they're discovering uh, new producers, directors, and actors and talent that hasn't been out there. So we may see the rise of new stars um, from content that is a little older. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's that's a really exciting trend. Um, so switching gears again, we're at a, a content market um, right now um, and people are pitching. You know, they're selling and they're pitching. Um, do you have any advice for folks pitching right now? You know, are there trends in pitching and what works when they're approaching you guys to to uh, to acquire their content? Come with as much data as you can. Sorry, Susan. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We have to raise our hands next time. <laughs> <laughs> I could address you directly. I could just look at you, or I could look at you. But but uh, go ahead. I'll we'll start with you. Um, what, what you know? What 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 would you recommend to someone pitching? I'll definitely come with data if you have that. So any any data proving audience engagement. Um, some of the distributors have been so innovative where they don't have authorities that do calculate the ratings for that content. And um, I remember one particular Arabic distributor putting together a showreel of all the positive comments of some very prominent people about a particular um, box set that they were selling and it was it just changed everyone's minds so come with as much data as you can nice point susan how about you absolutely data is the key actually to approach uh, any content acquisition person and uh, but also when the, the when the content actually unique and uh, it fits uh, the the culture of whoever you're approaching um they will have a point actually to consider trying and I mean trying this kind of content because today we are absolutely different than 2017. We are really open to try different kind of contents and uh, data is the first absolutely, but something unique and different 
we are really open for something unique and different. There was a period, period of time we were repeating it, repeating each other and copy pasting from each other. It's not the same right now. We are open for new things. Yeah, but and are there um, countries that um, have a more direct channel to pitching to you guys um, that are more well established um, with their history with you? You know, you, you can think about really well established uh, production companies, um, you know, in the rest of the world that have been doing this for so long. Um, do, you know, are you more apt to stick with, you know, your, your uh, the partners that you've been working with so long and then maybe independent uh, producers can go through that channel or, or is it, has it really widened and pitches are coming in from everywhere? Pitches are definitely coming in from everywhere. Uh, the established studios do continue to be very strong partners with us. Um, it's, it's only because their relationships, libraries, and their ability to deliver to the very specific market of IFE that we continue to work with them. But we never, we never say no to hearing what anyone new has to say. Um, and everybody, I think, can reach out via LinkedIn or via email to any of our offices to get in touch. Uh, on pitching. And, and Susan, are there better ways to connect on pitching um, in terms of, if, uh, you know, if you're not going through a more traditional route? We are in the digital world. The, we always can arrange a call, but the best way actually to send the catalog to us uh, via email. Um, we are lucky in this digital world, so if they can reach us anyway, anyhow. Uh, as simple as that. <laughs> and we're kind of, none of us are really going anywhere. So, <laughs> so are, are there, I'm just going back to again, Ina is so rich, um, as you guys have all referred to. Are there some international trends that are impacting what's happening in your region um, in, in reference to content and content preferences? Um, you know, any big trends coming from other marketplaces with content that you're looking at and going, huh, I think we should try that here? We definitely keep our um, ear to the ground to see what's happening in every market where entertainment exists. but. Airlines are also very innovative with what they do. The thing about IFE is that you have a passenger for 30 minutes to say seven, eight hours on average, and you have only that short window to entertain them in. So you have to come up with a different way of doing things up there. You have to be unique, right? What about you, Susan? Any, any thoughts on that? Um, again, you have to really be unique, and uh, and yes, there's lots of uh, trend has changed in our region. Um, the video in demand changed everything, changed the industry, changed the audience, changed the change us how we think and how we look into the content. So, um, in a nutshell, uh, we became more curious audience. Uh, we are really open to discover different type and genre of uh, content. So the key is to be to have the quality and the uniqueness. So interesting. And one of, one of the big trends in um, the U.S. right now is is user generated content, but not the kind you know a long time ago where um, you know you would just shoot yourself doing something goofy but more aggregating um, genre content that people out there are shooting and then putting it together to create channels. Um, is that a trend also in Mina where you're aggregating content from users? Maybe it's influencers like YouTubers or, or folks like that, whatever the channels are in Mina um, and then packaging it together. Is, is that a trend also in your region? I won't call it a trend, okay? I won't call it a trend, but uh, I would like to highlight that we did experiment that. 
we did uh, especially in our region and in particular in ksa youtube and youtube content uh it's very big and uh, and it has its own stars and influencers so us as a platform we did experiment actually bringing these uh, content uh, producers and influencer and we package everything in in our platform we did experiment that uh did it work um, as we expected no but not necessarily because the idea was wrong or the content was wrong it's it's something it's maybe it's not the habit or the trend got it it, yeah. it would be the same over here lori with ife it's um it would be it's a nice to have and it has to be really good quality and we have used user generated content on some airlines um the thing is with the user generated content if it's too short say 5 minutes or 10 minutes say let's let's say it's a tiktok video it's not enough to entertain a passenger up where they would like to put something on for an hour to 2 hours and just enjoy the entertainment so if if that kind of uh, content is you know that kind of length then we look into it so length is 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 also it and then again that cultural relevancy what's appropriate for the for the culture what one last question from the um audience before we start to wrap up and get your final thoughts um we have some questions on you know are you guys impacted working with um and purchasing content from some of the global giants right now like the netflixes the amazons um you know those entities that seem to be really owning um content right now or do they play in your ecosystem as well yes, let's start with you susan <laughs> yes very much you just, you just spoke so smart i can't decide who to ask the question to so. <laughs> um netflix and amazon we are happy to have them here in the region for some reasons actually they did uh, they did they did play a big role to uh, develop or mo modify the industry let's say due to them i think we start looking at the content in a very different way uh do we work with them closely yes as a telco communication we do work with the uh, ott providers and video on demand uh, platforms closely got it and what about you i uh, see oh um, just are you getting content are you getting content from you know all of these big entities as well you know the the big e's here definitely and and it is so kind of interesting how these productions are made for example if you look at the marvelous mrs mazel mm. um, that sits within the amazon library as an original but it comes to us via one of their partner studios for the ip industry oh, industry so, okay interesting not, not necessarily uh, mm. they don't really affect us that much but uh, we are we're we're very happy that they have taken the industry to where it has reached it just shows how important content is so it's more about the the show itself and actually necessarily um where it's coming from um we have to wrap now but i just wanted to see uh, and we'll start with you uh faminda just any final thoughts on this any any uh parting words that you want to give for our fantastic audience um about um the in-flight industry and where things are going what to expect in the next year any guidance you can give them yes so uh, we're slowly powering up keeping an eye on what the airlines are saying about their businesses being powered up some markets have picked up already emirates is being really fantastic with the way that they're growing their route network and as have other global carriers i'd say it's it is getting there uh, but it would be completely up to the way the airlines managed to tie through the whole thing but we're still around as are the airlines so please do reach out to us with anything relating transport rights great and and susan any any parting thoughts for our fan fantastic audience yeah, thank you very much to be part of 
this event and please try to reach me if you uh, need me to see your catalog or if you even if you have any question about Middle East, I'm more than happy to answer it. And how would you you like um, everyone to reach out to you, um, Susan and uh, Faminda? Um, email, reach out to your companies. What's the best way to, to get in touch? Email, LinkedIn. Send. If, if you see me on the street, say hello, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so let's let's start with finding you on LinkedIn, and then they can um, they can uh, track you guys down that way. Um, and so, Faminda De Souza, the manager of IFE and Media Services for Spafax, and Susan Sultan, content acquisition and strategy manager at eVision. Thank you so much for joining us at this session for another fabulous Nappy Virtual here at the Dubai International Content Market. It's been so fantastic to dig into what's happening in MENA and just learn about the overlap between global trends and all the fantastic things happening in this thriving and diverse uh, community. Even at a crazy time, there's so much growth and excitement happening. So on behalf of um, everyone at the festival, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Have a great day, have a great morning, wherever you are in the world, be safe.